Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Mr. Jack Benny in Stephen Leacock's My Financial Career on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, Mr. James Hilton. For a Christmas greeting your friends will long remember, make your selections now from the complete Hallmark collection on display at the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. Whatever your taste, whatever your budget, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark cards. And on the back of every one is the identifying Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. And now it is Hallmark's pleasure to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight, the Hallmark Playhouse presents a dramatization of a short story by Stephen Leacock, entitled My Financial Career. Since this story concerns a man and a bank, and the insertion of the man's funds therein too, we of the Hallmark Playhouse felt that the role of the man should be portrayed by an actor with a thorough knowledge of banking, and a deep love and a great respect for all matters monetary. <laughs> In casting about for such a personality, one name kept cropping up, and that name was Jack Benny. <laughs> Accordingly, we opened negotiations with Mr. Benny, and after three days in a hotel room, we managed to conclude a financial arrangement which satisfied him and still left a few pennies for the Hallmark people. <laughs> Our staff of attorneys and economic consultants unanimously agreed that it was the most difficult and complicated transaction since 1803 when Thomas Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Territory from France. <laughs> in view of Mr. Benny's long and familiar association with banking institutions and his easy insouciance in dealing with them, it is paradoxical that in our play tonight, he portrays a character who suffers from an overwhelming dread of banks and bankers. This is perhaps the most challenging role in Mr. Benny's career and should provide the severest test of his histrionic ability. And now, without further preamble, we present Mr. Jack Benny as Rodney Beamish in our very free adaptation of Stephen Leacock's My Financial Career. My name is Rodney Beamish. I'm married and have three children, a son 26, a daughter 12, and a little boy just six months old. I don't believe in rushing things. <laughs> in dress, I'm conservative. I always wear a black frock coat, a derby hat, and I ride to work every day on a bicycle. For the past 19 years, I have been employed as a troubleshooter in the zipper department of the Eagle Clothes Company. <laughs> My wife and I and our three children share a large, airy, comfortable room in a modern, attractive garage. <laughs> I mention all these things to show that I'm a normal, average citizen. Yet, I was singled out by fate to bear an awful burden. All my life, I have been a slave to one terrible, morbid obsession. I, Rodney Beamish, am possessed with an overpowering, craven dread of banks. <laughs> The very moment that I crossed the threshold of a bank, my knees turned to water and I sort of float the rest of the way in. <laughs> However, for the past 19 years, I had been saving my money, a little each month, until now I had amassed too large a sum to keep in the house, $56. <laughs> so fighting against an unreasoning fear, I started out for the bank, holding the money clutched in a crumpled ball in my pocket. When I neared the doors of the Security First National, my nerve gave out. I stopped in my tracks, unable to take another step. The doorman looked at me suspiciously, and after a couple of hours, he walked over to me. Hey, 
mister, we don't allow loafing in front of the bank. What? You've been hanging around for two hours. Well, I, uh, I plan on going in. You ain't the impulsive type, are you? No, no, it's just that, well, I guess I'm just plain frightened. What's the matter, bud? You overdrawn? No, no, it's a psychosis. Psy who? Kosis. It's Freudian. Do you know Freud? Not by name, but if he's a depositor, I know his face. <laughs> no, you don't understand. It's a complex. I'm afraid of banks. I've always been afraid of them. Well, maybe something happened a long time ago that scared you. Did you ever lose money in a bank? I never lost money anywhere. <laughs> but wait a minute. Something did happen to me a long time ago. It was before I was married. I was going with a girl named Alexis Lujak. She was a chocolate dipper in a candy factory. When I took her out, I loved to hold hands with her all evening and then go home and lick my fingers. <laughs> I remember now, I went to call on her one night. When I got to her house, there was another fellow waiting for her. His name was Bull Jensen, and he was sort of a local tough. Ah, uh, Bull was handy with his fists, but that meant nothing to me. I just put on my glasses and sat down. What are you doing here, stupid? Oh, hello, Bull. I've got a date with Alexis. Oh, you have, eh? Bull, cut it out, will you? Let go of my wrist. You're hurting me. Let go. Why don't you make me? Ouch. Ouch. Say, what do I have to do to you to make you fight back? Oh, no, I'm not going to tell you my secrets. Bull, Jensen. This minute, or I'll never talk to you again. Talk, talk. Who wants to talk? Ouch! Now get out of here. Rodney, you come back here. Who are you going to listen to, Bull or me? So the guy beat you up and you ran out. What's that got to do with being afraid of banks? I didn't tell you, but Bull Jensen's father worked in a bank. Uh, it still, still don't make sense. Now, come on, come on, walk right in. I'll help you. You see? Why, there's nothing to it. Before I knew what was happening, I was inside the bank. My temples throbbed, the muscles of my throat constricted. My whole body quivered in the grip of horrible fear. I staggered over to one of the windows. The teller looked at my haggard face as if to say, What's the matter, sir? Is there anything wrong? And then he said... What's the matter, sir? Is there anything wrong? <laughs> I explained to the teller that Banks rattled me. He was an intelligent chap and tried to help. If you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, I'd venture that your trouble can be traced to some psychological upheaval in the past. Now, that's what I keep telling myself, but I just won't listen. Try to think back, sir. Is there any incident you remember that would have some bearing on this neurosis? No, no, nothing. But wait. Yes, I do remember an incident. It happened many years ago when I was in college. How the girls used to flock around me when I played my mandolin. Oh, I was handsome in those days. My chestnut hair was naturally wavy. And sometimes an unruly curl would slip down and nestle against my forehead. <laughs> I had flashing white teeth. And when I smiled, two dimples would hold my mouth in parentheses. <laughs> Our football team was playing State U in the biggest game of the year. And we were losing 76 to nothing, with only two minutes left in the game. It was beginning to look bad for our side. <laughs> But the coach had been saving me for just such an emergency. Beamish! Beamish! Yes, coach. Go in at quarter. There was a roar from the crowd as I put on my helmet, whipped off my blanket, and ran out on the field. I looked down and realized I had left my pants in the locker room. <laughs> the coach rushed out another pair, and we went into a huddle. It was a tense moment but they fit. <laughs> the crowd roared. It was do 
or die, and I was willing to do. I lowered my head and charged into the line, but it was like hitting a stone wall. I found out later they were wearing concrete jerseys. Everything went black, and when I woke up, I was in the hospital. My head was so swollen, it was two years after I graduated before I could take off my helmet. <laughs> Well, that was unfortunate, Mr. Beamish. But what has it got to do with your being afraid of banks? Our team lost the game. I failed when they were banking on me. <laughs> but that's not reasonable. Now, why don't you pull yourself together and state your business? I, I want to open an account. There. You said it. Now, wasn't that easy? Just step over to that desk and ask for our cashier, Mr. Williams. I turned and started to walk across the floor. And then once more, my strength seemed to melt. Again, I was in the grip of that nameless dread, that relentless creeping fear. I felt myself stinking, sinking into the bottom of the <laughs> pit. A light in my brain exploded to a thousand colors. Brown, orange, green, and that certain shade of blue that was so becoming to me. <laughs> and then the bottom fell out of the world, and I crashed down into the black abyss of oblivion. In a moment, James Hilton will return to present the second act of My Financial Career, starring Jack Benny. But first, wouldn't you like to send Christmas cards this year so unusual, so beautiful, that your friends will show them to all who visit them during the holiday season? Then visit the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. See his collection of Hallmark personal Christmas cards and see how true it is that whatever your taste, whatever your budget, there's a Hallmark card that you'll be proud to send. You'll be fascinated by albums of Christmas cards illustrated by famous gallery artists. Cards rich with the feel of silken tapestry. And the cards for men with hunting scenes that set any man to dreaming. But tonight, I'd like to tell you especially about the Hallmark Blue Book. For on every page of this beautiful album is a Hallmark card that's a heartwarming reflection of the Christmas spirit. You'll see a jolly Santa Claus, a toy train full of good wishes, reindeer poised for flight, Evergreen so fresh you can almost smell their fragrance. The sparkling snow of a white Christmas. Yes, they're all here. All these and many more of the well-beloved Christmas symbols. In Hallmark personal card that you'll be proud to send. Card your friends will be proud to receive. For when they see the Hallmark on the back, they'll know you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. <laughs> As we begin the second act of my financial career with Jack Benny as Rodney Beamish, we return you to the hard stone floor of the Security First National Bank upon which Rodney has just collapsed. The mysterious hysteria that seizes him whenever he enters a bank still holds him in merciful unconsciousness. But now he's beginning to stir. Oh. oh. I felt myself floating in a gentle sea and soft waves were splashing over my face. <laughs> and then I realized that it wasn't a sea. I was lying on the floor in the bank. I had fainted and they were trying to revive me by throwing water in my face. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Beamish, but we didn't have any water handy, so we had to use ink. I looked down and saw that my white shirt was now a blue polka dot. <laughs> I offered to pay for the ink, but they wouldn't hear of it. They even gave me some blotter so I could dry myself. <laughs> the teller was very kind. He tried to soothe me. We chatted for about 15 minutes, and then he helped me up off the floor. 
I thanked him. Now, Mr. Beamish, why don't you see our cashier, Mr. Williams, and tell him exactly what you want? I walked over to Mr. Williams, still shaky from my experience. He greeted me cordially. Well, well, are we feeling better now? We? I didn't know he had been sick, too. <laughs> I apologized to Mr. Williams and explained my phobia. He was very understanding. My dear Mr. Beamish, this obsession of yours about banks is merely a quirk, a twist of mind, probably incurred through some incident in the past. Perhaps as a youth you had some trouble concerning a bank. No, no, not in my youth. But wait a minute. Yes, I do remember an incident in the past. When I was 37 years old, I ran away from home. <laughs> I was determined to see the world. I made my way to San Francisco and found myself in a waterfront dive. There was a tinny piano playing and the place was full of sailors. They fascinated me with their lusty manners and their salty talk. Ahoy, matey! Mind if an old sailor drops anchor alongside? I looked up and saw a typical old seaman standing at the bar next to me. He had an ugly scar that ran from ear to ear and a sort of nasal twang where his nose should have been. <laughs> I didn't want him to think I was a landlubber, so I tried to act nautical. I said, shiver me timbers. And asked him if he'd ever been around the horn. Captain Hook's my name. I've sailed the seven seas for 40 years, man and boy, and neither of us ever regretted it. I stood there and listened to him spin his briny yarns. He was the skipper of the Nancy B, a trim little steamer out of Seattle by War Admiral. <laughs> when the time came to pay the check, we both reached for our money. And it was then I envied him. He didn't have any. <laughs> Suddenly, a feeling of weakness came over me. My legs started to buckle. I tried to unbuckle him, but it was no use. Too late, I sensed that I had been drugged. And I knew I was being Shanghai. <laughs> I regained consciousness in the boiler room of the Nancy B. Two stockers were stripped to the waist. Or is it stokers? Yes, it's stokers. Anyway, one of them kicked me in the head. Hi, matey. Briggs is my name. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Briggs. He stuck a shovel in my hand and pointed to the blazing furnace. Feed it. I flung a shovel full of coal into the fiery pit. And a tongue of flame shot out and licked my hand gratefully. <laughs> Then the hatch opened and Captain Hook came in. No longer was he the kindly old tar I had met in the waterfront saloon. Now he was a cruel, bloody tyrant. Ah, oh, vast your scurvy skulking swine. Lift that shovel. Tote that bail. Get a little drunk and you'll land in the brig. <laughs> he had the lyrics all wrong. <laughs> but I wasn't going to tell him. When you work for Captain Hook... You'll work 26 hours a day. 26 hours a day? I thought it was impossible. But he came down later and made me set my watch back two hours. <laughs> it was miserable down in the stoke hole. I longed for a breath of fresh air, and one night, I reached the deck unobserved, and I saw a girl coming toward me. She was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. And grimy as I was, she was glad to meet me. She said I reminded her of an old boyfriend, a coal miner from Scranton. <laughs> her name was Stella. She was a passenger on the ship, and she told me all about herself. I hated to make this trip. I've been away for so long. First, I had to go to Paris, and then Egypt, Rio, and Australia. And then when I get back, I'll have to go to Honolulu. But why do you keep doing it if you don't like it? I can't help it. You see, two years ago, I hit the giant jackpot on a quiz show. <laughs> and I've been traveling ever since. I felt a strong bond between this girl and myself. 
Fate had played a cruel trick on both of us. But for this one fleeting moment, we were free and the moon was beautiful. She leaned toward me and I reached out to unfold her when suddenly Captain Hook was there ahead of me. He kissed her and then with a twinkle in his eye, he turned to me and said, You skulking swine! Get back to your hole before I slit your gullet! As he dragged me away by the gullet, <laughs> Stella stared at me uncomprehendingly. There was a wistful look in her eyes, a nod of knowledge of things that were not to be. I never saw Stella again. <laughs> Mr. Beamish, I realize you went through a terrible ordeal, but uh, why should that make you afraid of banks? Oh, I neglected to tell you. Captain Hook had me flogged because I had forgotten to bank the fire. <laughs> but uh, that's not good logic. Now, why don't you just forget all that and, and tell me how much you would like to deposit? Well, first, I want to see the president alone. Alone? I don't know why I said alone, but Mr. Williams nodded and fetched the president. My fingers tightened on my $56. Are you the president? I asked him. Yes, I'm the president. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Truman. <laughs> the name is Dewey. Dewey? Cornelius J. Dewey. I'm president of this bank. Oh. Step this way, please. We'll be safe from interruption here. You are one of Pinkerton's men, I presume? He had gathered from my appearance that I was a detective. I explained that my feet were naturally flat. <laughs> I had been born with fallen arches. He looked surprised and asked me what I wanted of him. What do you want of me? I want of you to open an account. <laughs> I intend of you to keep all my money in this bank. Of you. Please sit down, Mr. Beamish. Uh, will you have a cigarette? Thanks. Hmm, lucky strikes. Ah, yes. <laughs> They're first again with bankers, too. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Beamish, you say you're going to keep all your money in this bank? Yes, all of it. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, exactly how much cash do you propose to deposit, Mr. Beamish? Fifty-six dollars. Fifty-six dollars? Mr. William. Yes, sir? This gentleman is opening an account. He will deposit fifty-six dollars. Good day, Beamish. I felt myself getting rattled again. I went back to Mr. Williams and handed him the $56. He took the money, made me write the sum on a slip and sign my name in a book. I no longer knew what I was doing. There you are, Mr. Beamish. Is it deposited? It is. I told him I wanted to draw a check. My idea was to take out $6. I had to have some money to carry me through the month. <laughs> he handed me a checkbook. I wrote something on it and thrust it back at him. He looked at me in amazement. What? Are you drawing it all out again? Miserably, I realized that I had written 56 instead of 6. Reckless with panic, I tried to brazen it through. I nodded. You're withdrawing all your money from the bank? Every cent. How will you have it? What? I said, how will you have the $56? In 50s. <laughs> 50s? All right, here's a $50 bill. Now, how do you want the six? In sixes. <laughs> he gave it to me. I thrust it into my pocket and started for the door. Only thought to escape from this devilish mausoleum. Odd fragments of my life flashed in front of my eyes in a crazy, unrelated pattern. <laughs> The center snapped the ball back to me. Then I realized it wasn't a ball. It was Stella. I tucked her under my arm and started off tackle. 
As I broke through the line, I came face to face with my old girlfriend, Alexis Lujak. She was dipping Captain Hook into a vat of chocolate. Paul Jensen's face loomed up in front of me. My head whirled. I knew I had to get to my bicycle. I made my way to the street in freedom. I paddled away from that bank as fast as I could. And I was halfway home before I realized I didn't have my bicycle. <laughs> but I was making such good time, I couldn't stop pedaling. <laughs> Besides, I'd never again go back to any bank. Let him keep my bicycle. I didn't care, because I was free. <laughs> free! <laughs> free! 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 <laughs> Mr. Benny, on behalf of the Hallmark Playhouse, I want to thank you for a wonderful half hour. Well, thank you, Mr. Hilton. I enjoyed it myself, even though Hallmark is a competitor of mine. You know, I carry a line of Christmas cards, too. <laughs> you, you know, actually, Mr. Benny, Hallmark has no competitors. You see, we use the most famous artists, the best engraving, and only the finest grades of paper for our cards. Oh. Well, mine aren't quite that elaborate, uh... I use the cardboard that comes back from the laundry in my shirt. <laughs> and this time of year, there are a lot of Christmas advertising in the magazines, some beautiful pictures. And I clip them out and paste them on cardboards. They make lovely cards. I happen to have one right here with me, if you'd care to look at it. Here is one. Here it is. Thank you. Hmm. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from two lovely ladies. Which twin has the Tony? <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? Well, it's very expressive. I just have a couple of dozen left at 50 cents a piece. <laughs> Hallmark puts out a very fine card for as little as five cents. Five cents? Well, no wonder things have been so slow with me. <laughs> Say, do you suppose I could carry the Hallmark line at the wholesale distributor's price, I mean? Well, the Hallmark cards are sold only in carefully selected retail stores. Do you have a retail store? No. No, but I have a beautiful suitcase and a connection with the police department. <laughs> I've got one of the best corners in Beverly Hills, you know. Well, drop in and we'll discuss it. Good night, Jack. Good night, uh, Mr. Chips. I mean, Mr. Hilton. <laughs> Gee, with Hallmark cards, I can double my business. Wait till I tell Mary about this. <laughs> Goodbye, Jack Benny. And thanks again for the delightful nonsense. Next week on the Hallmark Playhouse, we will present Rose Wilder Lane's Free Land, starring Martha Scott. And on succeeding weeks, we will bring you Victor Moore, Ida Lupino, and the finest stars in Hollywood. So make Thursday night your Hallmark Playhouse night. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. That home of your own, education for your children, leisure time, all these can be part of your future if you invest in United States savings bonds now. The sure way to save is the automatic way through the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. Protect your future with United States savings bonds. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Hugh Wedlock and Howard Snyder with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Our director producer is Dee Engelbach. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Rose Wilder Lane's Freeland starring Martha Scott. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>